Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Let's all stand together. We're going to start this morning. And everyone's really excited. How is everyone this morning? Oh, that was, that was you just, that was like I just rolled out of bed situation. How is everybody? Are you, are you excited about this morning? This side, this side barely got out of bed. Good. No, is this side excited about this morning? All right. Not that it's a competition, but if it was a competition, are you guys, this side of the room, how much more in love with Jesus are you than this side of the room? Okay. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see during worship how much more in love with Jesus this side of the room is. No, just kidding. Hey, today is Mother's Day. Did you guys, okay. Listen, some of the moms are like, I need something today. Someone's going to give me gifts, presents, clean house, money. Something has happened. Let's do this. Would you, would you around, just around you, would you look and find a mom and just say, you're amazing. Tell them how amazing they are. Oh yeah, do it good. Do it good. All right. All right, back up here. Back up here. Moms, it's our hope that you feel so special today. It's our hope that your kids are just so extra nice to you today. It's our hope that your house is clean today and you don't have to be the one to clean it today. At least today, just one day. That, that would be, that'd be amazing. Here's what we're going to do. Listen, as we're going to do our very best to, uh, to honor moms, but more importantly than that, if there is such a thing, uh, we know moms are, are so amazing that even, even the Savior of the world had one. So that is, that's a true statement there. Uh, and we're going to just take time this morning to love Jesus. Can we do that together? Is that going to be so good? All right, so as, as well as you honor the moms next to you, could you just lift your hands in the air, begin to honor the Lord, and we're going to enter into worship today.
Grace of the Savior, with the heart of the Father, and you're all we need. And you're here, with the hands of the healer, by the power of your Spirit, and 
Let's just put the name of Jesus on our lips right now. Let's just bless the holy, precious name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We worship you, King Jesus. We exalt you, King Jesus. You are the worthy one. You are the holy one. Bless your name, mighty King, mighty God. We're going to partake in communion. And if you don't have a, uh, a little cup, then, uh, just find one. The ushers, raise your hand. If you guys in the front, if you have a cup, you can stay here. And if not, you're going to have to run back to your seat to get your, get your communion cup. I know you guys don't see me up here very often. My name's uh, Rich Schmidt. I work with BSSM. Uh, I'm one of the Bible teachers in our environment. What, what? I got some friends out there. And uh, I thought maybe we'd do something a little Bible-y as we did communion today. Go ahead and have a seat for just a moment. Before coming here, my wife and I uh, pastored in New Jersey for 16 years. And I don't know if you know this, but New Jersey has, uh, New York area has one of the highest concentrations of Jewish people in the world. In fact, even if you count Israel, I think New York City is still the third highest concentration of anywhere in the world. And so there's a lot of Messianic Jewish friends that we would have. And in our um, grocery stores, we had a whole section of kosher food. So kosher means it's acceptable. It's, it fulfills all the, the, the requirements of Jewish law uh, to be eaten at Passover. And so we have this whole section. One of the things that's in there is matzah. So matzah is like this large, think of a large saltine cracker, all right? But there's certain requirements for matzah for it to be acceptable, kosher, uh, kasar le peshak, the Hebrews might say, uh, kosher for Passover. And so the first thing is, it has to be unleavened. Isn't that interesting? What's leaven a symbol of in the Bible? Frequently, it's a symbol of sin. So this piece of bread has to be without sin. Second thing this bread has to have, and it's a flat, like a saltine cracker, right? It has to have holes pierced in it. Wasn't he pierced for our transgressions? And then in the process of making it, they actually take a very sharp knife and they score the outside edges just to make these little stripes. By his stripes, we are healed. And finally, they have to bake this thing to just the perfect temperature so that the surface almost blisters. Just these little blisters would just start to open up. And, and doesn't the word say that he was beaten and he was bruised for us? There are so many Old Testament pictures. There are so many Jewish pictures that point directly to Jesus Christ. And at Passover, the Jewish people, they would take these three pieces of matzah. They have a special thing they do during the Passover Seder. And they would always take the middle piece of matzah. Isn't that interesting? Not the top one, not the, the middle piece of matzah. And they would pull it out. Why don't you pull out your little emblem right now? And what would they do? They would... They would take that middle piece of matzah and they would break it. They would break it. Why don't you break your piece right now? What did Jesus say as he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples and he got to the bread? And we're not exactly sure what that bread looked like, but he got to the bread and what did he say? This the bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. So as we partake of this together in just a moment, let's keep in mind the sinless, pierced, striped, beaten and bruised body of Jesus. 
that he went through all of that so that you and I could know him and love him and serve him and commune with him. Let's eat the broken body together. You guys know that the Passover meal, the Last Supper, we call it, the Passover meal was a celebration of Passover, which was the ancient uh, history of the Jewish people when they came out of Egypt, the Exodus and all of that. And it, it was highlighted by that meal where each family would take a lamb and they would sacrifice this lamb and eat the lamb and they had to get ready to go at a moment's notice. And, and do you remember what they had to do with the blood of that lamb? They had to take a branch, they had to dip it in the blood and most of our storybooks, it says to put it on the lentil and the door posts. And so most of our story posts, like the lentil is that piece above the door, and so they would just splash some blood there, we would think. And then the, the door posts are these things. And so in our minds, we see these splashes, okay, just around the door. But I have this Messianic Jewish friend, and he said, I don't think that's what the Old Testament actually says. You'll have to check with them because I'm not an Old Testament scholar, but here's what he said. He says, you're supposed to strike the lentil, the top piece, once. And based on the language that he was understanding, you would hit that top lentil once and the blood would drip down the middle of the door. And then the Hebrew specifically says, you're to strike the muzazot. You're like, well, what in the world's a muzazot? Jewish homes, the, the guy across the street from my house in New Jersey had what's called a mezuzah. It's this small little metal thing that's tacked onto the door frame, right about here, about four or five feet high, and it signifies that it's a Jewish home. And the Jewish families would only have one of those, but in the Hebrew, it's plural. So if there would have been another one, where would it have been? It would have been at the same size, same height, on the other door frame. They were to dip the blood strike the lentil once and the blood would come dripping down the door. Then with one strike next time with this blood, strike the muzazot one time. I'm not sure, but the children of Israel may have avoided the angel of death with the cross of blood stricken across their doorpost. Isn't that amazing? Let's open this emblem that we have. The word says, by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And the New Testament quotes that and it talks about physical healing. It's not just talking about spiritual healing. It's not just talking about forgiveness, but all those things are included. But it's talking about physical healing. And so before you partake of this, I want you to think for a moment of somebody in your life that really needs a physical touch from God. It might be you. You might be like, it's me, Jesus. I'm the one that needs physical touch today. And just silently, won't you just right now say that name before the Lord and say, Lord, would you touch? Would you touch me? Lord, would you, would you touch my son? Would you touch my daughter? God, would you touch that family member that's hurting right now and desperately, desperately needs a touch from you? together, let's just say thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do as we partake together. We're going to stand up for one more song of worship, so why don't we stand together? Let's let the worship team lead us.
let's just give one more shout to Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We just declare you are our Lord. Amen. All right, well, you can have a seat. We want to welcome all of those of you who are first-time visitors with us. If you're a visitor here for the first time, would you please raise your hand and just keep them up. Our ushers are going to come. Let's hear it for our first-time visitors. Keep your hands up, please. We also have a number of visitors that were here for the healing conference. Would you just raise your hand as well? How many had a great time at the healing conference? We had some people staying with us this week, and they just said it was amazing. God showed up in mighty uh, signs and wonders and healings. So, uh, yeah. Hey, I want to tell you about what's going on tonight. We have baptisms. Say baptisms. So baptisms, if you want to be baptized tonight, 5 o'clock, meet in the east-west room, wear dark, bring a change of clothes, okay? And yeah, and now we're going to transition to church news. Hey, Bethel family, happy Mother's Day. We are so excited to celebrate with the powerful women in our lives today. Here's this week's church news. Bethel Reading Weekend is coming up June 2nd through 4th, and local church family, we want to see you there. There will be a special session with Michael Maiden on Friday night, tons of fun activities on Saturday, and times of encounter and refreshing at church on Sunday. Registration information will be coming through email, so keep an eye out in your inbox and enjoy this incredible weekend with us. Bethel Conservatory of the Arts has two events coming soon, one in person and one online. First, join them online for their three-day online creative summit from May 17th to 19th. 20 world-class speakers, including Bill Johnson and Chris Vallotton, will help you grow into the artist you were meant to be. Then on July 9th through 14th, join them in person for the BCA Summer Intensive. This one week intensive is designed to accelerate your skills as an actor, dancer, screenwriter, or filmmaker. Learn more about both of these opportunities at Bethel.com forward slash church news. Men, are you living a life that you're proud of? Do you have brothers that you can stand shoulder to shoulder with? We're gathering men for this year's Brave Co Conference, June 21st through the 23rd. We want you to be catalyzed for the life that you were born to walk out as a man of God, confident that you have the tools that you need to live it well. We'd love for you to join us. Learn more at Bethel.com forward slash events. Guys, I want to see you there. Join us for Bethel Family Camp happening July 1st through 8th. We've got a great week planned with a day at the lake, evening cookouts, group games, water activities, worship in the field, and plenty of quality hangout time. Summer at Bethel is on its way and we cannot wait to connect and adventure together. Learn more and register at Bethel.com forward slash church news. That's it for this week's church news. If you missed any of these announcements, go to Bethel.com forward slash church news to learn more. See Have ya. an amazing week. <laughs> oh my God. See ya. Good morning, everyone. I have the privilege of getting to lead you in the offering this morning. So I just want to encourage you as we turn our minds towards that. It's a little hard to follow Lauren's humor <laughs> to come in, but, but that's fine because that's how we do family here. Uh, but I do want to encourage you. We're going to posture our hearts. And since I'm one of the missions pastors here, I chose number two, offering reading. We're going to pray into the nations. And, and again, we're giving from our wallets and our purses. But, but really, if it's not coming from our hearts, uh, it's not the kind of gift that the Lord is asking for. So I encourage you to posture your mind, posture your heart as we do this. So let's read together offering number two. If you would, please stand. You ready? As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, 
impartations, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. We do just give you all the praise, Jesus, and it's all about you getting the full reward. That's why we're here. That's why we give. We just want to partner with you with what you're doing in the whole world. We love you, Lord. We commit the rest of the day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, and now I believe we have a special Mother's Day video. My mom is delightful. My mom is brave. Kathy brings comfort. She is a woman who is uh, carrying the power of the Spirit of God. Mm, she's the best. Uh, Mommy. I think one of the greatest things that I love about my wife is the way that she loves people. People feel the love of Jesus through her so tangibly. And that's awesome. <laughs> I think the first thing to note is that every woman has the capability to be a mother. Women naturally carry the people they love in their hearts. And it is God designed us naturally to reflect what we do spiritually. I grew up in a single parent household. My parents were divorced. We grew up in a situation where, you know, she was the breadwinner and she was doing her absolute best. So Cindy has embraced uh, not only uh, our birth child, but also our adoptive son. As a little girl, I can remember my mom every day sits at the kitchen table and she journals. I would wake up in the morning and I see my mom spending time with the Lord and she does it in such a public place. It's like, it's the kitchen table. It's not, oh, I'm gonna go into my bedroom. I'm gonna go into my office and have alone time. It's like, actually I'm inviting you to the table with me. And maybe the biggest thing I experienced from her was no matter the circumstance, whether we were in abundance or we were in need, the Lord was faithful. The Lord was going to come through. We could trust Him. And that carried through a lot of really challenging moments, um, through illnesses, through death, through um, financial hardship. Um, but she modeled that so significantly throughout the course of my life. Motherhood goes beyond physically birthing a child and it goes to this place where we have made room in our hearts and in our lives to hold people, to hold their future, to see beyond what they can see. That's part of the beauty of motherhood is it, it, it never ends. Uh, even if relationship is broken, um, there's something about the beauty of motherhood that holds on. If I was a shining star and did really well in school, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna celebrate you. And if I made a mistake and if I'm like down in the dumps, she still is choosing me and speaking life. Spiritual moms can see the prophetic vision on the life of an individual. It's when we really grab a hold of that that you become a parent. From the moment that I met Kathy, I found a mom. She was loving, she was kind, she was gentle. I think Cindy's ability you know, to, to love our kids as well as our spiritual kids for wherever they're at you know, in life has really shown me just a, a fresh glimpse of the Father's unconditional love for us. Getting to see my mom actually be a mother to people who have mother wounds and to, have, to people who haven't had a mom present in their life, it just wrecks you because I've experienced the goodness of my mother's life and I've experienced how sweet and tender she is. And so to get to share that with somebody else is so easy. Kathy's comfort brings immense courage. Uh, I'll never forget, someone was getting a deliverance in one of our offices and you could hear it and Kathy stepped in as a mother and got right down on their level in their ear and you could feel authority come in the room. She saw that person get set free. It's who Kathy is, she brings stability, she brings the power of God. It provokes me as a daughter, it provokes me as a mother. Bethel women, happy Mother's Day. 
Thanks for being in this fight with me. Thanks for saying yes. Thanks for all those unseen moments where you never got thank you, but you remained faithful and true. Be it a biological mother, an adoptive mother, or a spiritual mother, each of you have lent in to what God has called you to, and you've carried His kids with you. I wanna encourage you women to continue to lean in. There's a generation that needs to be brought forth and birthed into the fullness of who God has called them to. Bethel women, we honor you today. We charge you today. We say, hooray, congratulations, but our work is not done. We'll continue to mother the nations until we see Jesus get His full reward. I love you, Mom. Thank you, Mark Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to you. Our creative team did a beautiful job on that. That was so beautiful. You guys doing well? Good. Well, I have a, um, Bill wanted to be here today, but uh, he's with his mom, Darlene, who went through a surgery yesterday. And so he's up at the hospital with her, and we're going to pray for her in just a few moments. And, uh, but I got to call yesterday that I'm the substitute teacher today, so uh, you all be good for me. Hey, if you're a mom, uh, would you just stand real quick? We want to just honor you and recognize you, just with our moms in Santa. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Super good. Online as well. We know you're not in the room with us, but many of you online uh, as well have just raised kids. It's such an important part. I do want to talk to you about being a mother and a father today, so that's uh, what I'm going to head into. But just real quickly, we're going to pray for Darlene. Bill specifically was praying for the make sure the swelling on her brain goes down from the procedure that she had. And then also, I, my nephew, uh, Max, nearly drowned in a pool in Alabama about on Wednesday or so. So my family's been interceding our leadership team for him. He's in the same spot. His, his, uh, his life is in the balance and his quality of life is in the balance still. Again, so grateful for those that are in the medical profession, the first responders that are there, the, the ER doctors and nurses who know what to do right after time of crisis. Medicine's done what it can do. We need a miracle at this particular point. So would you join faith with me and then online as well. We're gonna pray for Darlene and a, I think a 93-year-old that needs the swelling in her brain to go down and a three-year-old that needs the swelling in his brain to go down as well. So Father, you've heard, you've heard already, and you've heard from us regularly and often, we ask for a miraculous breakthrough for Darlene and for Max in the name of King Jesus. And we say to the demonic realm and even the old ancient curse, you have no place or authority. The Lord rebuke you. And we ask that angelic, however the angels are involved in healing, let them be loosed to bring a great grace of healing as well. We're just aware that they ministered to Jesus after his temptation on the night he was betrayed. Be there and minister to them as well. But of course, Jesus, your touch, <laughs> your radical healing that does an extraordinary miracle is exactly what we're thinking about. My spirits just remembered, I'm remembering Ben, artist also, who was in a traffic accident a couple weeks ago. We pray that his mind as well and his, that his body would recuperate fully and beautifully. We invite the grace of healing into our brothers and sisters' lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you for praying with me and for them. Uh, again, that's uh, Darlene and Ben, and uh, also his name is Artist, and then Max as well. Well, I also had the privilege of doing a memorial service uh, yesterday for a 97-year-old mama, and we had about... Um, I think we had 12 of her great grandkids running around at Twin View, and... Um, just celebrating her life. It was a beautiful moment to see my, my brothers and sisters in their late 60s, early 70s who are weeping at the loss of their mama all these years later, having such, made such a tremendous, important impact on them. And um, Eleanor was a, uh, just a member of Bethel Church for 63 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I think I've been here a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, but she's here double what I've been here, so... She's with the Lord now and a beautiful just matriarch in this house and, and um, um, so privileged to be with the family yesterday and just to see the quality of her life. She ran through the tape. She ran the race, you know, as Paul talked about beautifully, and uh, she's in the presence of the Lord, her Savior. Well, I want to um, 
speak with you just about uh, moms especially, but of course it applies to dads. And then the video did a beautiful job of talking about how in the family of God, we're all moms and dads or brothers and sisters. In fact, that's the general model that the Lord's given us for how we should kind of think about our connection is family. So as I speak to moms, um, just realize it's not just if you've got kids at home or adult kids, uh, but, uh, but spiritual kids as well, as in the video talked about. And uh, adopted kids, foster kids, that you are insanely important to their well-being and to their socializing and to their transformation. And so uh, let's just pray for me real quick. Papa, let grace be on my words and on this, this house as I preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good. Let's, I'm going I'm, I'm to give you some, some powerful scripture, and then uh, we'll talk through some, some uh, powerful opinions, hopefully based on scripture, and uh, we'll roll through it from there. Scripture um, realizes the role of mom as a teacher. You are radically essential to the socializing of our kids and of our society. M- uh, moms, there's no replacing your role at teaching values, kindness, priorities, and what's important. And scripture speaks to this really profoundly. I'll just read to you a couple of passages of scripture about this one you're really familiar with, I'm sure, in Proverbs, about how if we train up a child in the way that he should go, he won't depart uh, from it. And some of us are like, well, my kids are trying to depart. I'm like, well, we're praying them back. You know, <laughs> and some of us are like, I've trained them pretty good, but they're pretty stubborn. The Lord is the hound of heaven. He goes after them as well and is wooing them. He is the waiting father whose grace is reaching out to them. But this promise of scripture is that as we train our, our kids, they will be able to be steadfast in the behavior and in the maturity we've called them into. The second verse to talk about is beautiful. It's out of, also out of Proverbs uh, chapter 1. And it talks about the father in the first part, but I'm just going to start with the part about the mama. It says this to to sons and daughters, don't forsake your mother's teaching. Amen. I mean, (laughs) it says it right there. Moms, you are a powerful force of socializing the next generation. It's incredibly important you have the same goals as the Lord and God's curriculum as you do it so that you were training them not in the ways we were raised or in the world's ways, but in the ways of the gospel and of what the Lord's up to. But beautiful scripture. Uh, Don't forsake your mama's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head, a pendant for your neck. My son... If sinners entice you, do not consent. It's verse 10. So the teachings of the women of our house, they come into the, the, the lives of our children and they are a, a garland, a crown of, of leaves that, we, uh, that denotes like a victorious general in battle or somebody who's won the race. Uh, they're a sign of kind of royalty and victory. Our mother's teaching is a sign of our royalty and our victory as we hold on to them. That's beautiful. <laughs> it says it's a pendant around your neck. And they didn't have a ton of jewelry back then. And a pendant generally was worn by somebody, a connotation of their social status or some role that they had. And especially in the king's court, you know, with Solomon writing this. But it's a, a, the mom's teachings is like right close to the heart, the first thing you see, right? And that's how important you are as teachers in the body of Christ. My prayer is today that you will embrace the grace to teach powerfully and nobly God's curriculum, not just for your own kids, but for the kids of our city, the kids of the world, and then your spiritual kids as well. The third verse, again, this is a beautiful bit of a real life Bible here. We're going to turn to Titus chapter, uh, let's see, chapter two, verses three and four. So he says this, likewise, uh, teach older women, just got to remember, so this is Paul telling Titus how, what he should be doing. So teach older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. Just stop right there. <laughs> got to love how practical the scriptures are here. Uh, just kind of coaching up. I think Titus is on Cyprus at this particular place. And he's basically saying, hey, they, they should see themselves as holy, embrace goodness, and not abuse alcohol. Like, that's good teaching right there. And that the older women are supposed to like live that and teach it to the younger women. I think it's, you know, we got this, in, at least in our world society, we have this idea of mommy wine culture or that whole deal. Like, I'm not sure that should be celebrated a ton. 
Huh? Say la? Think about it. <laughs> but this idea of not being addicted to much wine, being trained in this by older women. Older women in the room, did you realize you're supposed to be training younger women in this room? Uh, it's not, we, in fact, I, we would have had probably one of our younger women, uh, uh, what, what, one of our moms preached for Mother's Day, but didn't seem quite polite to call him the day before Mother's Day. Go like, hey, can you prepare a sermon and preach four times tomorrow? So I thought we're like, we'll just leave you alone. Have Mother's Day. I'll get something going. So <laughs> I'll whip something together. So um, mothers, uh, older women have this opportunity to train younger women. Let's keep reading here. They can train the young women how to love their husbands and children. That's beautiful. You're like, isn't love spontaneous? Sometimes. <laughs> Doesn't it roll out of the giganticness of my heart? Kind of. Lots of times it does. But <laughs> the actually training our young uh, women to love their families is something older women can do. And again, husbands can be rascals sometimes, tough to love. So they, we need some training <laughs> in how to love them. Kids can be hard to love. I told my wife I used to go to work to rest. Uh, I... I <laughs> I didn't tell her that until after the kids were older, but the, uh, <laughs> that's not, is that true? Oh, let's not talk about that. So the, I was busy at work, don't get me wrong, but she was way busier. So um, teaching the older, the older women, teaching the younger women to love their husbands and uh, to be uh, pure, to, sorry, to be self-controlled and pure. This is our message to each other, to be busy at home. Again, there was no outside work at the time here. All work for women was generally in the home. So this isn't like a saying we can't work outside the home. It's just speaking to the, the, the situation of the day that that's where women found places, the place to work was in the home. And then also to be, uh, uh, to be busy in the home and kind and to be subject to their husbands. The word's actually submissive so that no one will malign the word of God. And so in other words, he's like, Living a, a culture where your family is loved and taken care of and your, there's harmony in the home through submission actually helps get the gospel forward in this particular culture. Now, in, again, we've talked about this before when I talked about how important marriage is for Christian discipleship and, and how central uh, Christian marriage is for a transformational relationship. And um, so, again, our marriages aren't fully designed to make us happy, but to also make us virtuous and like Christ. And so... It's important, uh, the role that they play. And uh, mutual submission is part of that. In Ephesians chapter five, it talks about submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. So it's not, the submission street isn't going one way. It's a two-way street as husbands and, and wives live together. But that's not what my preach is about today. Um, and then two more verses just about how important this role, this teaching role you currently possess, whether or not you've embraced it or not. 2 Timothy 1.5 uh, Paul is talking to Timothy. He said, the faith that's within you um, that was at first in your grandmother Lois and then uh, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. And so you have this amazing thing where Paul is writing to his young protege and he's recognizing the folks who were shaping his life before he shaped his life. He's recognizing grandma and mom and, and honoring their contribution to who Timothy is. Here you've got a guy who comes alongside one of the most important apostles that we have, who's written, you know, anointed, authoritative passages of scripture, and he's celebrating how moms actually taught their son Timothy the way of faith. And it had an impact on the whole world through his ministry to Paul and with Paul. And so this capacity to teach is God-given, it's essential, it makes a difference in the world. And then the passage that I want to uh, center on most here at the beginning is just out of Proverbs 31, it's verse 26. It says this, uh, it's, again, a, this is a husband and children speaking about the, the, their wife, their mother. And she says, uh, the scripture says, and she opens her mouth with wisdom. And this is the ESV, the teaching of kindness is in her tongue. So the mothers actually are equipping with this emotional EQ, the teaching of kindness. They are um, enabling them to say, "This we are a kind family. We are a good family that does good things. 
Um, and that's a good translation of it, but if we could go below that and just look at what the Hebrew said, and you can do this as well, just go to blueletterbible.org, you know, find the scripture, click on it, it'll give you the Hebrew, and then it'll give you the transcribed words. But actually, if I was just to kind of speak this one literally to you, it says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the Torah of Hesed. Yeah, Torah, it might be a word you recognize, it's the law, and Hesed is that word in the Old Testament for covenant love. If you're familiar with the New Testament, agape, that's the Greek word, uh, the self-giving love. Hased is the self-giving love of the Old Testament. And so in our wives' mouths, in our mother's mouths, in our sister's mouths, is uh, the, the covenant law, the law of covenant love. And so we are teaching our kids, we are teaching those that we're ministering to and training the law of covenant love, it's in your mouth. And again, so I want to encourage you, like, reflect on your goals as a teacher, because you are one, and reflect on your curriculum, because every once in a while, we have some junky curriculum. And something that's like, boy, I believed that for a long time, and apparently it's completely wrong. So <laughs> we have to kind of like, from time to time, in our quiet time, let like the wind of the Spirit kind of check through our curriculum, and especially this beautiful idea that you women are teaching the law of covenant love. So, having the same goals. Uh, so I've given you some powerful scripture, now I'm gonna give you some powerful opinions. You should weigh these and figure out if these kind of work for you. And then also just a realization that as I'm talking about this, some of you are gonna think, I did some of that wrong or I didn't quite have that right. Please don't let the enemy throw any accusation your way. Take none of that guff from him at all. If there's like a nagging voice, it ain't mine. You live in grace, beloved, and the Father loves you right where you're at. He loves you um, too much to leave you there. We'll talk about appropriating grace for this task. But as we talk through it, listen, the, uh, here's some goals that I felt like the Lord uh, reminded me of, is that I, my goal with raising my kids, and I have, I have my oldest one here in the front row, handsome as ever, whoop, whoop. Uh, my, my wife for Mother's Day has got the youngest one up in Oregon for a basketball tournament, so that's where they are on Mother's Day. That's how Mother's Day rolls. Um, I'm not sure why they plan a tournament on Mother's Day, but there you have it. Um, Oregon hates mothers. I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. It's not true. I told you, some opinion should be flushed. So, the, uh, <laughs> so some of my goals. Listen, it was always my goal that I was raising adults, not controlling kids. So if we could just think about it, our kids are in our house for about 18 years, and then they're out of our house for 70 years. It's really important that we equip them for the 70 years they're out of our house. And if we can think through, my most important thing is to get them making great decisions, to teach them that they're fabulous and powerful decision makers, to have them to, to talk through their decisions before they make them, to help them have the skill of seeing where the movie goes, you know, playing the movie out, where this decision leads to this decision to this decision, kind of helping them as decision makers is very profound. And, and this idea that we're not just controlling our kids for our own peace of mind or controlling them long enough, to, long enough to get them out of the house, but we're actually teaching adults, soon to be adults, that we will one day have an adult-adult relationship with, fellow adults with each other, and to equip them to be fabulous decision makers. And part of this came through Danny Silk's teaching. And if you haven't read Danny Silk's book, Loving Our Kids on Purpose, Again, I think it's a beautiful beginning articulation uh, to the gospel, how the Father loves us. Danny's one of the ones who talked about empathy with our kids and then giving our kids lots of choices while they're in the house so we can grow. If you're parenting and haven't read that, I can't recommend it more highly than that. And again, his daughter, Brittany, also has uh, you know, some, some books she's working on with imperfect parenting. And uh, another book I liked it with my elementary, my preschool kids was Love and Logic, Magic for Early Childhood. Listen, I don't believe in magic. Neither do, do they, these guys. Uh, but it's Jim and Charles uh, Faye, and I found they, they had the same concepts as Danny, and uh, that, yet they kind of put them in preschool size, so I found it really helpful to kind of think through that. And that's where that idea of like, hey, you get to make a choice is like, hey, you want to brush your teeth now or in five minutes? Five minutes? Okay, it's always five minutes, but it was fine. My kids were making a choice. I didn't have to tell them to brush their teeth. They got to choose, now or in five minutes. The idea, will I brush my teeth tonight, was never on the table. Uh, but the, the, the idea was, is you can decide when it happens, and then We've talked about this. You can use the blue toothbrush or you can use the red toothbrush. Which one would you like? I want the red one tonight. Good choice, son. So this idea that we're actually teaching our kids this being decision makers in the home while we're with them, 
super powerful and super helpful. And I, I, I re- really recommend some of those things. And then adding it to what you already know and your, your own uniqueness as well. Terrific way to think through it. So you're raising adults uh, who are not going to be in your house very long. This idea that I'm trying to teach them to be powerful decision makers, to realize they're responsible for the decisions they make. Responsible? I get to, I get to control that when they're in the house with me. And so uh, also important, so thinking through the goals that we have, um, and then I always was kind of in the back of my mind is this idea that I wanted to raise adults that I would like and respect. <laughs> Just a little subtitle, raising adults you'll like and respect at some point, was that their, their lives are worthy of respect. And they are fun to be with. I like being around them. So let me talk to you. This is one of the important parts here is that I think moms and dads and spiritual moms and dads, we need to think through what are the goals that we have with our teaching and our mentoring. Probably in the last three weeks or so, I've seen three kind of famous Christian moms. Um, they, they don't talk about their faith a lot, but I know them to be believers. But they've kind of said kind of the party line, which is what we're, I think we all think we're supposed to say, which is, well, I don't care what my kids do. I just want them to be happy. And I'm like, Oof, that is not the Lord's heart for your kids at all. I just want my kids to be happy is not the gospel. If you are thinking through, I'm a teacher, and I'm like, okay, you are. What's your curriculum? What's your goal? My goal is to raise happy kids. I'm like, you're halfway right. You're halfway right. But if you don't have also the corollary goal, I want to raise righteous kids, kids of virtue then we're, it's actually a disaster. Yeah. Creating just happy kids is a disaster. It creates a selfish, self-involved, exactly. my way. It's like the book of Judges. I do whatever's right in my eyes. And to help you with this, the first person I saw or heard speak about this was Professor Lewis Marcos. I think I have his name right. He's at a university in Texas. I think it's Houston University. Um, but go ahead. I've created a graphic for you because I think this is so important that you need to catch it. And I thought they need a graphic. And so... Uh, there you go. <laughs> it would, I found out I was preaching yesterday, so that's what, that's what you get. <laughs> but the, um, the, the, what he was talking about here was like, listen, if you just want happy kids, you're like, your kid is a zero on the righteous scale and a five on the happy scale, congratulations, you raised a sociopath. <laughs> Super happy serial killer. <laughs> Self-absorbed, you know, that their, their happiness is the goal of life. Listen, you raise a kid that's a terrible citizen and tough to live with. If, that's, if we've got somebody who's really a five on happy and a zero on righteous. And so we, this idea that I just want my kids to be happy is like, oh, it's not enough. The goal is much more profound and beautiful than that. And again, so uh, uh, we're talking about the goal is actually to have a kid who's a five on happy and a five on righteous. That of the virtue line. Now, again, we know some Christians, not fun to be with, who are like a zero or a one on the happy scale, but they're a five on the righteous scale. They're called Pharisees. I mean, they're uh, they're tough to be around. Super hard to be around. (laughs) Listen, I mean, the church was kind of that for a while. Like, listen, we're keeping the rules. We're not happy about it. You wouldn't believe what I'd do if God was, wasn't watching. But forget that. Uh, but at least I'm keeping the rules. And part of what I love about, you know, the, the, the Toronto blessing and the gift of the Holy Spirit in that time was this, it was a rediscovery of joy because the church had kind of been like, yeah, we're a one on the happy scale. Apparently that's what God wants for us. But, but we're a five on the righteous scale. Like, it's pretty miserable, frankly. So this rebirth of joy, of emotional experiences with God, ecstatic experiences with God. And suddenly scriptures, you know, you, you see it with new eyes and you see that the kingdom is, a, you know, is, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Since so we, we got two of them right there on that little graph. I need to get a peace graph, but I'm, I can't do quadratic equations. So <laughs> this math joke for you. The, um, <laughs> and I lost my place. Anyway, so the... Uh, what was I saying, Jerry? No. <laughs> Quadratic equations, thank you. That's not helpful. Uh, <laughs> peace. And so it says, and joy. So joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is love and joy. 
joy is the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, just, you know, that it mentions that Jesus in Hebrews chapter one, he was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his peers. And so you get this realization that Jesus and God is actually full of joy. We talk about it, God's not, God's, uh, when we say God's good, he's in a good mood, we mean he's a joyful God. Joy is the serious business of heaven. That's what C.S. Lewis would say. And so this idea that the church should be full of happiness, I love that, but it can't be at the sake of virtue and righteousness. And so, again, you see, we can have like sociopaths up at the, up at the top left-hand corner, the bottom right-hand corner, you can have like Pharisees, no fun to be with. But what we're going for, you probably can recognize that they're on the graph. Ah, yes, Jesus, right there. That's the Jesus spot right there. It's the place my heavenly Father's trying to raise me to get to. His goal for Dan Fairley is, I want you to be happy, son. I want you to be virtuous. And we kind of think those are exclusive. He's like, those aren't exclusive. Those are actually life. Those are actually life. Jesus, our model for ministry, was full of joy and full of virtue. And so this, when I'm talking about you guys are teachers, and I would say, are your goal, the curriculum, the, the goal you have for your mentoring of fellow adults or you're raising up the children in your house is, if it's just merely happiness, it's not good enough. And it's actually dangerous. It's not the gospel. If you look in scripture and go, God, is it your goal I'd be happy? Like, nah, that's, that's one of them. It's not the only one in there. So make sure that our goals are lined up and synced up with the Lord's. And this is his plan. If you just, again, think about the Lord wants me happy and virtuous. These are non-exclusive. A lot of the world tells you they are. Again, that's love not the world who tells you those are exclusive. Those aren't exclusive. Those are actually intertwined with each other. So you can go ahead and take that. I hope you get all that. Is that super clear? Okay, I just want to, some of you might have still been taking notes just to really nail that down. <laughs> so at, now think about your curriculum as well. And this is where, just thinking through this beautiful testimony about uh, Heather having her quiet time at the kitchen table. My mom had her quiet time at the kitchen table. She'd be up early in the morning listening to Chuck Swindoll. Today, I'm using her Bible. Uh, I've got, it's got her notes in it from, uh, you know, that she's got highlighted, I have no greater joy than my kids are walking in righteousness. And uh, I think it's out of Second John or Third John. And um, so she modeled that for me beautifully, loved the Lord. She modeled, we went to church. Not only did we go to church, we supported the church financially. We supported it emotionally. When the pastor wanted to do a bookstore, mom said, I'll do it. So we, our family packed up boxes of books, unpacked them for the book, ba balanced to the book table every time and put it all back together. So we were at church before everybody got there and after everybody got there. We were, mom taught us to be servants to be servants in the house of the Lord, to be in the house of the Lord, and not just on Sundays, but again, to be a, somebody who, who reached for Chuck Swindoll's teaching, who had her quiet time in a public place where I could see it and, and uh, see her participating in it. It's beautiful things that she taught. Um, I remember uh, one of the things that she taught, she taught me that was so profound, and I must have probably heard this every day of the week, was, uh, listen, Dan, the world does not owe you a living. <laughs> the world doesn't owe you a living. And I'd leave dishes in the sink and be like, the world doesn't know you're living, Dan. I'd have a messy room. I don't know, son. I don't know about this. The world doesn't know you're living. And some of you are like, what does that mean? Like, like the world's not gonna take care of you. Like, you get out there and be responsible. And it's very interesting to take mom's folk wisdom. Remember, my, I'm saying to you, you have an inner curriculum. Does your inner curriculum line up with scripture? So I'm taking mom's inner curriculum, the world doesn't owe you a living, and I've got this, my heavenly father owns a thousand hill, cattle on a thousand hills, and, um, and I've got, I'm, I have an inheritance that comes in from the Lord, and, and I'm like, these are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Again, knowing the generosity of the Lord, yet taking on responsibility for my decisions, to realize my decisions had consequences, and I was a powerful decision maker, and I would... Uh, most likely live with the decisions I made. This is an interesting discussion, a different preach, right? But the law of sowing and reaping doesn't go away. Grace interrupts it, but it doesn't go away. Grace is an interruption of it, and sometimes we don't get what we deserve, but often the Lord doesn't go, I, I've, I'm done with that law. That's actually the way you train mature people is the law of sowing and reaping with occasional interruptions of grace. So mom said, hey, the world doesn't owe you a living. I'm like, That's, that helped create my work ethic. 
It helped me realize there'll be a time I'm out of this house and responsible to balance my own checkbook, that I, I'll be the one trying to figure out what purchases to make and not make, and that, that my career, I better pick something that's either that I love or that creates enough finances to you know, have a family. Was I going to have a family? It's like, hey, Dan, so mom's inner curriculum, her folkism actually kind of lined up with scripture. If you, don't work, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's one of the scriptures in the same passage where we're talking about the law of sowing and reaping. One of the other things that got passed down to me, though, uh, turns out um, not as true. So, the, uh, <laughs> so, and this wasn't a necessary, this was one, wasn't from mom. This was for, probably from dad and then the entire world. So uh, it wasn't just them. But I remember being raised in the time of mosquito hawks. And uh, mosquito hawks were like these bugs that would fly around the garage, and you often see them dead on the, wind, uh, the windowsill, and they would fly around, and my dad would say, hey, don't kill that, that's a mosquito hawk. And it, what do you mean, dad? Like, well, they, they're like a hawk. They swoop in, and they eat mosquitoes just like a hawk eats a rabbit that he finds somewhere. Like, oh, that's amazing. So there are friends. I love me some mosquito hawks. How many of you know what mosquito hawks are? You heard of them? Okay, yeah, so you, you, you know. So there's mosquito hawks. Don't kill the mosquito hawks. I go to Christian camp. My camp, my children's pastor, whom I love, oh, that's a mosquito hawk there. Those are our friends. Yay, they're our friends. I go to youth camp. Those are mosquito hawks. They're our friends. Don't kill them. So I give mosquito hawks a free pass in my house because they're trying to do a great service. Like, I, I've got to honor this idea of the mosquito hawks. And um, so this is, this is gospel for me. This is the truest truth in the world passed it down, was going to pass it down to my children. Um, but at some point, at, at about 38, I'm reflecting on my curriculum. And I'm thinking to myself, I've actually never seen one of those mosquito hawks with a mosquito in its mouth. Yeah, it was, it was 30 years in, but I'm starting to do some thinking. And I'm like, and they seem insanely stupid because they just bounce around along the top of the garage. And I'm like, the garage door is open. No mosquitoes here. You've eaten them all. Go out into the world. So, but I can't find the garage door. And I wasn't even sure I was going to talk about this, uh, except that the Lord, no lie, three mosquito hawks, two last night, as I'm like, Lord, do you want me to share the mosquito hawk story? I encounter two mosquito hawks. This morning as I'm locking the door to come to church, another mosquito hawk is bouncing against the corner of my house. I'm like... You're just dumb as a bag of hammers. Okay. So, so I'm like in my garage, like I've never seen one eating one. And so, you know, what's going on with this whole thing? And, and so finally I get in my head, I'm like, I'm going to go find an expert. So I talked to Mike Seth, who is our children's pastor here. And at the, he had before that, his, uh, he, was, he was bivocational for a while. He was our children's pastor and he was uh, in mosquito abatement for the city of Reading. And I said, um, I said, Mike, you would probably know, Mike loves bugs. Like he's got, he used to have boards of beetles into bugs, and he tried to show them, like, oh, those are delightful, Mike, thank you. <laughs> Bug people are their own sort of people. So they, um, it takes all kinds in the world. So he's like, they're beautiful, they're, uh, okay. So <laughs> I said, Mike, listen, what's this thing with mosquito hawks? Uh, like, I've never seen with a mosquito, they seem really slow, and uh, they seem really dumb. Like, are they, do they actually hunt mosquitoes? He's like, oh, no, not at all. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you? What do you mean? He's like, yeah, they actually don't have mouths. They, uh, they don't have mouths. And I'm like... <laughs> 30! 30 years! <laughs> 30 years! But letting these things get a free pass. And all along, they're a lawn fly. <laughs> you learn something about language. Mosquito hawk, yay! Lawn fly, kill! You know, like, it's like... Whoever the uh, PR person is for lawn flies, well done. I mean, that's amazing. The, the spin doctoring on that, my goodness. So, but it turns out, you know, I got, I got handed this idea from my parents. It turns out to be completely inaccurate. <laughs> Didn't bother to look at it till I was 30. So I was 30 and just unreflectively passed it along. Like I would say that as, as you are mothering uh, either children in your home or your adult children or other folks in the church, as you fathers, you're part of Brave Co. and you're leading into other people, you need to reflect on that inner curriculum that you're teaching. Some of it's going to be gorgeous and some of it's going to be flat out wrong. And one of the reasons we listen to good preaching and teaching and we read our word is because we do need that inner curriculum to be adjusted powerfully. The, um, there was a time, it's a different talk, but there was a time when our teenagers came out of high school and into our home, 
and they were in the world of adults in our family for a bit. And they watched uh, A-Team or Brady Bunch, depending on how old you are. They were just in a different world. But our teenagers are in the soup of each other's opinions constantly. Constantly. I say that to say there's a curriculum out there trying to train our kids if we don't. Who's actually using high-level technology to, you know, to do that. And so being able to realize, no, I actually am a mentor, a teacher. Scripture says, in my tongue is the Torah of Hesed. The Torah, the law of covenant love is in me. And so being in tandem in united with the Holy Spirit, as we kind of think through what is this curriculum I am passing off to my children or to my adult kind of other uh, folks who are in the Lord who I'm trying to mentor and take care of as well. I, one of the things that my mom taught me that I still use today, super powerful, she, um, part of her curriculum, I would, so I would have a, a sleepover, a couple of things happening. So like uh, sleepovers were awesome as kids, as adults, turns out they're kind of terrible, uh, which is, I never understood. Dear God, bless my parents. I mean, the amount of times we had sleepovers and then, the, sorry, if your kids would come over, I'm sure they were, they were well behaved in my house. But the... Uh, <laughs> It is so interesting, though, to have other people's kids in your house. You're like, hey, this, is, this was awesome when I was like seven. It's less awesome at 47, uh, you know, to have this. So anyway, I would get a sleepover planned, and then um, I, would, I would get an invitation, and I'm planning on going to so-and-so's house. But then somebody who was more wealthy and had a nicer house and better snacks would ask me if I could sleep over at their house. And there's a moral dilemma for my seven-year-old heart. I already have an obligation and made a promise, I'd super like to get out of that and go to the more wealthy family's house with the better, they have Captain Crunch, they have sugar cereal. I've been there, I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> so I'm trying to finagle, right? I'm trying to figure out like, mom, it turns out I want to go to so-and-so's house instead of so-and-so's house. And she's like, didn't I just give you permission to go to their house? Yeah, she's like, so? Well, I'd like to get out of it. Oh, no, no, no. That's not how we treat people. My, my mom taught me, you don't have a promise and that you're going to somebody's house and you get a better offer and you cancel that and you go for the better offer. And so she taught me the Fairleys don't treat people that way. We don't, we don't do that to people. Part of that inner curriculum for her. And like I said, it was beautiful. She didn't do love and logic or, you know, uh, Danny Silk's loving our kids on purpose, but she, uh, she still did it. She's like, you're well, you got two choices. You can sleep at your house alone <laughs> with me, you know, <laughs> in our house, or you can go to your first friend's house, but those are your choices. Like, oh, okay. I go back to keep my word to my first friend because the Fairleys don't treat people that way. That's right. And so the, the way that you are, the curriculum, the, the, that you, have, you know really well inside and out, again, it constantly needs to be kind of, not constantly, but just regularly reflected upon. Is this, is this accurate? Like I said, many of us might have said, I just want my kids to be happy, but today I just told you, like, please don't say that anymore. That's not the gospel. Add a second part to that. I want them to be virtuous and happy. Right. Righteous and happy. So this reflection is super important because moms, you are our primary people who socialize. And you know this about me if you've listened, is that I do think we get born again, but then we come into God's family and then he tries to skill us up, coach us up, tool us up. We're not born with all the tools. We have, we, it says in Peter, we are participants with the divine life, but then... To faith, we need to add other things. And again, we can get into this more in, in some weeks ahead, but real quickly, I want you to kind of look at a passage in 2 Peter where you, we have a curriculum that Peter's giving to the whole church about how faith is good. Listen, we're saved by faith alone, and uh, by the, we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone, not our works. But then once scripture says that's true, it goes, now I want you to behave like the son. I want you to behave like God. I want you to become like him. And this, the, the New Testament's full of coaching for people who are Christians. I'll say that again. <laughs> the New Testament, full of coaching for people who are Christians already. Like there's more maturity. There is more to learn, further to go. So in 2 Peter, we just see real quickly the um, uh, verse, verse three and four are beautiful, talking about how we are participants in the divine nature I'll just, verse four, through these, he has given us a very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Moms and dads, we are participants in the divine nature. We're not left to just merely our own devices, our own personality, our own socializing, our own upbringing. 
We are participants in the divine nature and escape the corruption caused the, uh, in, in the world caused by evil desires. And then verse five, which is what I want you to focus on. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord. You wanna be productive and effective? You and I need to add to our faith, godliness, self-control, perseverance, goodness, brotherly kindness, There's an expectation, there's a curriculum in scripture that we will continue to cooperate with by God's grace. Again, I'm not a polite enough person, a nice enough person. Dear Lord, I'm not a disciplined enough person. Lord knows that. But I can be an object of grace. I can be responsive to his grace. Lord, I'm willing. I am willing to have you reshape me. Search me and know me. See if there's an anxious way in me. Uh, you know, that something that, I've been, that I would teach that isn't true, something that reflects my heart and values but doesn't reflect yours. And so I just invite you as mentors, teachers, moms, fathers, to have the same goals as the Lord and then to let him look through the curriculum of your life and to let scripture, to take on scripture as like the, the most soundest place from which to get the training that we train our kids in and we train others in. I'm gonna pray for a, a, a grace to be apportioned to you right now. And um, really, if our, our moms, do we, we had you stand, but do we pray for you, moms? Let's do it. Just moms, just stand up real quick. We're gonna pray for you. And, um, and listen, if you're like a spiritual mom too and you wanna stand and you don't have like biological kids or foster kids or adopted kids, go ahead and stand up. So these are, um, okay, now everybody that uh, wants to be a mom someday. <laughs> there you go. There you go, good. All right, good. Good, there we go. And then, yes, and then folks who at this point have not been able to get pregnant and would like to be, yes, stand up as well. Beautiful, love it, love it. Well, let's do that prayer first. Papa, people that are married and want to get pregnant, <laughs> we ask for grace <laughs> that you would uh, you bring a miracle of life into their, into their body, that there'd be a breakthrough for that and let no weapon formed against it, no difficulty stand against it. We ask for the grace of healing that would bring forth a a child in their life. Now, Lord, I'd ask for a grace to be on all of us. Just something from you, the want to. It says in scripture, you're at work in me both to will and to do. I pray for my sisters that you'd be at work within them both to will, the want to, the volition would be there, and the do, the actual activity. And that there might be a real synergy of your uh, what their, their inner curriculum with what you know to be true. I believe that every single one of these women standing want to teach truth. And I ask for grace to do just that. And I'd ask you'd make them even more powerful and profound and impactful than they've ever, than they've ever been. I pray, Lord, they be continued to be used as teachers of, of covenant law, has said love, loving kindness law, and that they would be blessed in that role. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless you guys. Great to be with you. We're going to welcome Libby as she uh, wraps up our time together. Thank you, Dan. Aren't you grateful for this man of God? Today is an incredibly big day for so many of us in our community. I wonder if you'd just stand with me for a moment Um, There is something that is even more significant than celebrating our mothers. And it is when sons and daughters come into the kingdom of God and become born again for the very first time. As you were listening to Dan's message and, uh, and, and you were sitting under the Word of God, whether you experienced the fathering and the, the mothering of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, whether you know Jesus or, or not, in this point, we want as a congregation, both online and in the room, to stop everything we're doing and saying, there is not a more important decision you can make today 
than accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. And if you haven't done that, we want to make space for that. If you're online right now and, and you know that that is something that God is calling you to do or you aren't a believer, you need to make that decision right now and get right with God. If you're in the room with our overflow or here and Jesus Christ is not the Lord and Saviour of your life, you need to make that decision right now and become a son and a daughter before any of us become a father or a mother. That is the first call and our chief purpose on this earth. If that is you and you wanna give your life to Jesus and you wanna say, Jesus, I receive what you have done for me, your sacrifice for me, and I give you all of me and I take all of your goodness and your righteousness and I take on the identity as a son and a daughter of God, would you just raise your hand boldly in the room right now? Beautiful. I, I see your hand. We've got one incredible daughter over here who's choosing to make that decision. And then I see a hand over there too. Amazing. Amazing. Another incredible woman coming into the kingdom of God. If you're in the overflow room right now, if you raise your hand, we have our pastoral team who's in the room and would love to pray with you. If you're online and you're making this decision, whether you're watching live or in days or weeks to come, this is your moment to surrender to Jesus. If you're live, just type into the chat right now, Jesus is Lord, and we'll get our team to pray with you. I'll jump on in a few minutes with you too. Um, and, and if you've made that decision, we have a mom here with one of her daughters and then one of a woman here, or even if you wanna take that jump and, and make that decision now, I'm gonna invite you to come to the front before we do anything else and I'd love you to join my friends here who are trusted and um, are trained and are gonna minister and lead you to the Lord. Would you just take that risk and come forward right now over here to this banner. Church, can we celebrate these incredible women as they come up to the front? This is the best Mother's Day present ever. Someone's daughter is giving her life to the Lord right now. This is amazing. And then if, if you came with this incredible woman here, would you just help her, bring her to the front and we'd love to pray with you. Church, we love you. We bless you. Before um, you leave your seats, if you're part of our ministry team, would you come to the front right now if you're on Bethel staff or you're alumni and you're on our ministry team? Would you begin to make your way to the front? And as our ministry team makes their way to the front, if you need prayer for anything in your physical body, if you need a breakthrough and you're trusting God for that today, is the day of the favour of the Lord, the Bible says. And this is a day for the miraculous. So I wanna invite you in a few moments to make your way to the front. Our ministry team will have their hand raised and they'll indicate to you they are available. And then online church, we bless you, we love you, and I'm sure we will see you in a few hours in our next service tonight at 6 p.m. We love you guys. If you have to go, be blessed as you go. The ministry team, if they have their hand up, it means they're available for, uh, to pray for you. So if you would like to come forward for prayer, you can. If uh, they're not available, you can just kind of wait in line here and we'll get somebody to you just as soon as we can. <laughs> hey church, we are so thankful for the harvest of the Lord in our community in this room right now. Uh, I'm thankful that even as we gather together in this space, we had a mom come to find Jesus for the first time, um, a, a, a teenage a preteen daughter come to give her life to the Lord. And if you are online and you said, you responded, as we gave out that call and you said, I need to make Jesus the Lord and Saviour of my life. I wanna just jump off our stage and jump on personally with you right now to pray that prayer. Um, if you know that you, you have a son or a daughter right now and you are trusting God for their salvation, um, even if there's a, um, your mother 
and, and you are praying for her salvation. You're praying for her to come to know the joy of, of living a life surrendered to Jesus. As I pray this prayer and lead our community who, who are choosing to make Jesus Lord and Saviour of their life, I'm gonna trust God that He will begin to move today around our tables as um, we gather together with family or as you make that phone call to your mom or, or a mother figure in your life that the gospel of Jesus would begin to impact your life and, and the people in your immediate family like never before. So. If that's you right now, I want you to just jump into the chat and, and let us know that you are trusting God and you're joining us to, to trust God to move in that mother figure or in your biological mother's life, in your family's life, in that phone call around the table. And, and I'm gonna stand with you for that. And if that is something that you feel in your own life, you need to get right with God. Would you pray this with me right now? It's really simple. I would invite you to pray with me and, and repeat this after me. God, I thank You that You sent Your Son, Jesus, to take on the sacrifice and the punishment for my sin and my sickness. Thank You, God, that Jesus was not just an example, but He is my substitute. He was my substitute. And so in the mighty name of Jesus, I receive the gift of salvation, eternal life, to walk with God as a son or daughter of God, whatever applies to you, for the rest of my days on this earth and into eternity. God, I give you my life. I give you every ounce of who I am, past, present and future. And God, I surrender that to You. God, You are not just Saviour of my life, but You are King and Lord of all. Jesus, I surrender to You. I'm gonna pray a, a, a really significant prayer over You right now, wherever You are on Your walk with the Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask that You would begin to move tangibly and profoundly in homes and hearts right now. We stand in agreement with Your Word that as Christ's sacrifice provided a way that all who were willing may be made right with God through Jesus. The curtain was torn, the divide between the presence and the holiness of God and man was torn in two once and for all. I thank You, Spirit of God, that You are moving and You are touching minds right now where there's been chaotic thinking and. Uh, uh, thoughts that are cloudy. I thank You, Holy Spirit, that they would sovereignly begin to be thoughts that are as sharp as arrows. In the Word of God, it says that You give us love, power and a sound mind. We ask for the gift of a sound mind through the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to mark those and their families right now in Jesus' Name. Holy Spirit, I thank You that You would be moving with a gift of wisdom. In the Word of God, it speaks of You, Holy Spirit, as a spirit of wisdom and revelation. God, where sons and daughters or, or even mothers right now are, are at a turning point, uh, women who are longing to be mothers are at a crossroads right now. I thank You, Spirit of God, that You would begin to release heavenly wisdom for next steps, revelation from Your Word, direction to Your kids in the Name of Jesus. I thank You, Holy Spirit, that, that You are our counsellor, the Bible says. You are the one who comes alongside us. I thank You, God, where men and women might be at the end of, of their rope and, and hope is lost, or even as Dan began to, spo uh, began to speak into parenting, where parents are wondering which direction or which approach or, or how do I respond to this when I have my own uh, healing and needs going on. I thank You, Spirit of God, that You are counselling and supernaturally coming alongside men and women right now, wherever they find themselves as the great counsellor. 
And Spirit of God, I thank You as You impacted my life, my husband's life, my kids' lives, and, and we encountered the tangible presence of God, the, the physical embrace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank You, Holy Spirit, that You would be marking men and women with not just power, but love. I thank You for a drenching of the Father's love through the power of the Holy Spirit right now. And I can see Helen Cox right now on the chat and she's saying, I'm a mother trusting God to bring my, my, my three children back to them. We're gonna pray over that and, and just call them in by name, Helen. And Kay, Casey right now is saying, and my shoulder was healed. Um, last week. And so Father, I thank You that by the power of Your Holy Spirit, we don't just have forgiveness of sin, but we have supernatural healing. And just as Casey was touched by the power of God, we release the total healing over Mary Bond's granddaughter, Anna, right now. And, and if you are watching this right now and you need physical healing, Jesus has paid the price. And so we declare the healing power of Jesus to mark your physical body right now in Jesus' names. And from my mother heart to your home, from this house of revival to yours, we bless you to have a day of healing, redemption and restoration in Jesus. And we pray for the supernatural joy of the Lord to come and fill every conversation, every next step and every moment that you have with the Lord. We love you and we thank God for you, church. I'll be seeing you soon.